Well, uh, congratulations for being here. Um, on a beautiful evening like this, it's uh, easy for even a lot of Christians to sort of skip this time. And um, yet, if we skip this time, which you're not doing, obviously, um, when we get to Sunday, somebody said it's like opening a gift without your heart being in it. And so this allows Easter Sunday to have our heart in it more. And so um, Ed just asked me to provide a, a brief meditation before communion. So in a way, we're kind of going back a day or so, depending on how you understand the history of this week. Um, because on, actually on the timeline, on Friday evening, Jesus was pretty much in the tomb, right? But we're going to go back a little bit and think about Thursday, and, or maybe it was Wednesday, because people don't, they, they talk about different timing, and, and just reflect a little bit on what it was like for the disciples and to, to actually experience that day, even though they were probably in a fog uh, until the Holy Spirit came. So um, I'd like to read uh, a, a passage uh, from Luke 22, um, and then just have some comments on it, okay? Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover meal for us that we may eat it. They asked him, where do you want us to make preparation for it? Listen, he said to them, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs already furnished. Make preparations for us there. So they went and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another, which one of them it could be who would do this? Jesus is using the occasion of Passover to do something very new in the minds and the hearts of his followers. He is connecting for them what they have always understood about the celebration of Passover to an understanding, a new understanding about himself. In Exodus 12, sometimes we know the generalities about big events in the Bible, but we don't always remember the particulars. In Exodus 12, um, the Israelites were commanded to take an unblemished one-year-old lamb on the 10th day of the first month. So on what would be their January 10th, if it was actually a bib, I think the name of the month was called. On the 10th day of their new year, they were to take a lamb, one years old, and keep it secured until the 14th day. And on the 14th day, at twilight, they were to kill it and put its blood 
on their doorposts and on the lintel. And I think most of us know why. So that the angel of death in the 10th tenth, tenth plague that was on, that was, that was to come upon Egypt, uh, so that the angel of death would literally pass over them. They were to, to roast the lamb, they were to eat it, and they were to burn everything that was left over. And they were to do that, they were commanded to do that every single year on the same day of the year as a perpetual remembrance. And the idea here is that they were not only to remember the event, but they were actually being called to relive the event as though they had been the first participants in the first Passover. And so they had been going through it for the very first time. And Jesus' disciples, I'm sure they were probably in their 20s, I'm guessing, had done this every year for as long as they could remember. And so verse 7 in Luke 22, Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. That was the 14th. That was the day. It had to be done that day according to the commands given to Moses. And the word Passover is mentioned five times in Luke's about eight verses in this text. Verse 15 must have sounded really strange to the disciples when he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Um, the lamb was supposed to suffer, not the leader of the feast or the ceremony. He went on to say in verse 16, and I won't ever do this again with you until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He repeated that stunning pronouncement only a couple verses later as he passed the common cup. And then if, if that didn't mix him up enough, he said, he distributes the bread and the cup and he tells them to remember him. Now, every year they were told to remember the event. They were told to remember what the lamb was all about and what God did, how God delivered. But now he tells them, on this Passover, I want you from now on to remember me. To remember that, and here's the connection of the dots, to remember that, that I'm the Passover lamb. And, and that in him... Their judgment, the judgment that should rightly have fallen to them, was overcome because of the blood that was applied, not to doorposts, but was applied to the human heart through faith in him. And that's why he called it a new covenant, because Moses, through the blood of animals, had established the old covenant, and now Jesus, through his own blood, which he was pointing to on the table in reference to the cup and to the bread, his body and his blood, was now the new covenant established. And so his blood received in communion every time we remember not what the Passover originally was about, that we remember that we, that this was done for us, that this was done because our sin needed to be forgiven. And so we, again, don't only remember what we, what's going on here, what we remember Jesus. In a sense, we're reliving, like, the, like, like they were told about the first Passover, we're reliving communion with God, literal communion with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit through Christ's work on the cross. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul, thinking about the Passover and the fact of unleavened bread and how they were told to take the yeast out of the bread, they were not to have any yeast. They said if anybody had yeast in their bread, 
For those seven days from the 14th to the 21st, they were to be cut off from Israel. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says to Christians, he's saying this to Christians now, clean out the old yeast, a symbol for sin, clean out the old yeast so that you may be a new batch as you really are unleavened, you really are the new people of God. For our Paschal Lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed for us. So as we come to this table tonight, let's, I mean, I don't think there's any better night in the whole Christian calendar to think about ridding ourselves of whatever yeast in our life is keeping us from walking in a sense of love, joy, and peace with God. So let's rid ourselves of all the leaven of our heart so that we can again participate in the very life, the communion with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through the gift that Jesus instituted to become the new covenant in his blood. We will fellowship and participate in his death and resurrection again by coming in faith to receive these elements. They, not in themselves, but as, a, as we are joined in faith with what we do here, we become acceptable to God. The, his blood is applied to us, and we not only are freed from physical death, we're freed from eternal death. And that's why this is the new covenant, so that we might be renewed in him forever. His kingdom will come one day, and Jesus amazingly says that he'll be sitting at that table with us in the kingdom. So let's remember that as we come. Our sins are forgiven. We walk with the resurrected Christ. We have a hope that will never fade because one day we will sit at the kingdom table with our Lord as the head. So let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would grant to us the eyes of faith so that we might see you as our paschal lamb. That we might remember again that you came and we especially remember this night to die on a cross so that we might be drawn back to God as we look to you. As you are lifted up, you draw all people to yourself. And so I pray that we would see you lifted up again and be drawn to you again as we celebrate Holy Communion and as we remember the events of this day. We pray for the Holy Spirit to come upon these gifts and upon us as we partake in faith so that these gifts may be nothing other or less than the body and blood of Jesus as we receive him in faith. We thank you in his holy name. Amen. We've read the words of institution by reading the text that he took the bread, he took the cup, and he said, remember me. For this is the new covenant in my name. So when you're ready, um, there's not going to be a line or anything like that. It's just going to be when you're ready. When you reflect and on what's been said tonight and on what Christ has done for us, come to the table on your own and partake of the meal. You'll dip the bread into the cup and then partake. One thing I might suggest, although this is completely up to you, given the communal nature of things, um, is that you may want to serve somebody else as well as somebody serving you. Whatever works for you as you remember the sacrifice the death and resurrection of our Lord on your behalf. I often think of the last days and moments of Christ as a solitary journey, like someone possibly on death row, alone, waiting, facing the fate of death. And if Christ were like us, he certainly would have known some disappointments in his final days. His disciples fell asleep in Gethsemane when asked to watch. Charges were brought to Pilate without many defenders. Judas sold him for silver, and Peter denied him and said that he didn't know him. Tonight, I wonder if we have fallen asleep when asked to stand and watch. 
Have we given a defense for Christ in this world? Have we sold out Jesus in our faith when we were tested? And have we remained in silence and essentially denied knowing him? The Father was very present with Christ during these times, and as I was looking over these scriptures uh, in anticipation of tonight, something stood out to me, and it was the intimacy of the Father through the journey of Christ to the cross. Christ's death was a prophecy God knew was to happen, and he stood with his Son. There were many intimate exchanges throughout Christ's journey to the cross and in his dying. And Christ, while on a solitary journey, was not alone. When we are in our time of wilderness, we are not alone. In John 14, Jesus was comforting his disciples, and he said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. And from now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. And Philip says, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Is that true for us tonight? that knowing the Father is enough for us? I want to ask us to repeat that line three times. Show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. He's on the screen. And then Jesus promises the Holy Spirit as a comfort. If you love me, obey my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth, and the world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him, and it doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later. He will be in you. I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me since I live you will also live. When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me, and because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. In Luke 22, at the Last Supper, so, and I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me so that you may eat and drink at my table like we did tonight in my kingdom and sit on thrones. And then Jesus, while in prayer on the Mount of Olives, he withdrew a stone's throw beyond them and knelt down and prayed and said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. In Luke 23, on the way to his crucifixion, it says, when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And just before his death, it was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The Father was fully present with and deeply loved his Son, Christ. Christ's identity was with the Father. Christ was his Son. Our, our identity is with the Father as well, and he is fully present with us tonight. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life.